The other thing you need is uh, the thumb drive which has the files. Um, inside of that is a folder called workshop. Um, inside of that is a folder called multiplayer. And then there is a copy of the model without the word finished. That's the one that you'll open. And then the one that says finished is just in case we don't get to the end, you have everything so you can go home and see what I did. So where's the, yeah, where, where are these drives? Thumb drives. I don't know where they are. <laughs> oh, they're in front of me. <laughs> So in this workshop over the next hour and a half, what we're going to do, um, if you choose to accept your mission, uh, is uh, we're going to play this game, uh, me, Nato, and Benjamin, so that way all of us can see what this game actually looks like, and then I'll lead you through the process step by step to build this game. Um, I'm going to go at reasonably slow pace. Um, if in the beginning I start losing people, I will slow down. Uh, but at some point, um, I not because I don't like you, but because I have an hour and a half, I'm going to continue. Um, so if you do get dropped behind, um, raise your hand or make a signal. Bob and Sarah can help catch you up. They generally know what I'll be doing um, and can kind of get you there. But at the end of the day, if you begin to feel kind of overwhelmed, it's better to drop the computer and just watch what I'm doing, because um, believe it or not, the stuff is actually fairly straightforward. Um, on the thumb drive, inside of uh, the thumb drive is a folder called Workshop. Inside of that is a folder called Multiplayer. Inside of that is a model called Tragedy of the Commons. There's another model in there called Tragedy of the Commons Finished. That is what we'll have when we're done today if we are successful. Can also get one? All right, so why don't I get uh, my volunteers with me? And uh, we're actually gonna play this game. This way we can see uh, a bit what it looks like. This is a silly little rip off of the fish banks that I made up. Um, the point in this game isn't that it's necessarily super educational, um, but that it's uh, educational to us as authors. Um, so I'm gonna refer very often to the concept of authors. You all in this room are authors. You make content. Um, I'll refer to players. That's the people who use your content. I'm gonna refer to roles. Each one of your players will take on a role in the game um, and will all interact together to create a single simulation run. So let's actually see what that looks like. Um, so multiplayer games, when you create them on Architect, uh, you can upload them for free. Um, and uh, by default, uh, they're open to the public. You can either have an account for the IC Exchange like both Nato and Benjamin have, and you don't see this screen, or you can be like me, and I'm on this strange computer that I don't know how to use, um, and so I'm not logged in, um, so the computer doesn't know who I am, so I have to enter a nickname for myself. So when you start the game, you enter in your name, and it says, uh, hey, Billy, here are all the active games, no games, that you can join. Uh, so I'm actually going to make up the game, um, and I'm going to give it a name, so this will be my game, and I hit continue. So now on Nato and Benjamin's screen, right. they should see a listing in there that says Billy's Game. Please click on that. Okay. And see, now you can see that the little chits that yeah. represent um, each <laughs> of us has been filled in. We have the concept of role um, on the IC Exchange. This is how we determine um, what decisions each player gets to make. So in this case, I'm farmer one, Nado is uh, farmer two, uh, Nado is farmer yes. two, and yeah. um, Benjamin is yeah, farmer, farmer three. Two. We're three farmers. Um, you can have, we have this concept called optional roles. Um, where uh, you can imagine a game that could be played with three people or could be played with five people. Um, so roles four and five would be optional. They wouldn't be required in order for the game to start. Now that I'm done explaining everything, I'm gonna click this ready to start button and it puts this little word in here that's telling Nato and uh, Benjamin that I'm ready to go. They click ready to start and the game begins. So very often, um, I don't know what's going on on this computer. 
Um, very often, um, you'll notice that. Uh, I messed up. I need to do something on this computer. So very often you'll notice that it requires consensus in order for um, something to happen. I have something on my screen. I know. Uh, I yes, don't. me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only you have something in trouble. Yeah. Okay. You're not supposed to be. It's just showing you. You have nothing, or you have something? I have something. Yeah, okay. so me too. Just yeah. I have something. <laughs> Come on. Does, does Tali, there's typo? No, 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 it's, it's me. I... Where's the slash on this keyboard? Uh -uh. Yeah, screen says a player dropped. Player. I, know, I know, I'm getting back into the game. Right. <laughs> To refresh your page, okay. And we'll do it from the beginning, okay. So you'll go through the same process. Good, we're all here, ready to start. There we go. Oh, right. oh yes. <laughs> Sorry, right before this, I noticed I had a spelling mistake <laughs> in the URL, and so I fixed it. Um, but that, of course, broke everything on this computer. All right. So uh, you'll notice. What was I talking about before this all happened? Rules. Rules. Oh, yeah. So we have the concept of optional roles. Um, that way, uh, if you have a game, uh, you know, with a flexible number of players, um, you can have that work. You know, so if you're, you know, you have a game that could be run with three or four players, and you have, um, you know, 20 students in your class, you can divide it up equally. Some teams of three, some teams of four, um, and uh, you can even have the computer play one of the roles. A role is a way of referring to a set of decisions and a set of outputs that a player is allowed to see. So what makes a multiplayer game interesting is that all information is not shared. I know different information than you know, who knows different information than he knows. Really, the dynamics of the game are driven through the interaction between the players equally as much, if not even more, than by the dynamics of the model. Um, so you're kind of having the feedback flow through the players. So now um, that we're all in, um, we set it up uh, so that there's a decision dashboard. Um, we can see here that, uh, I think I set this up as cow. This is the story I made. Um, and we have a big, giant shared field. Um, and right now, the total herd size, so all the cows owned by the three of us, add up to, um, what is that? Something like 350. 360? Yeah. 360. Um, and then uh, we can look at you know the amount of grass that's in this field, and we can see that it's been decreasing um, over time. Um, so we're grazing this field. And uh, there's a market. Um, this is how much a uh, cow is worth on the open market. I could slaughter one of my cows and sell it for 800 bucks. Um, or if I wanted to, um, I could buy a cow not slaughtered, but one that could one day, you know, reproduce and make more cows for a thousand bucks. Um, so now we have, the three of us, Nato, Benjamin, and myself, have to make decisions um, about uh, how many cows to buy, how many cows to slaughter, and now, you know, I'm showing my secret information to Nato and Benjamin. I'm showing them how many of the cows I own and how much, of mon you know, how much money I've been making, and I'm gonna show them unfortunately, the decisions that I make on how many cows to buy and how many cows to slaughter. 
So um, I'm going to make my decisions. Um, so uh, Nato and Benjamin, can you not make your decisions for a second? Yes. No. Don't hit submit. Yeah. So I'm going to decide to purchase a whole lot of cows because I'm going to try and game this game. I'm going to try and get a huge population of cows and have them breed so I don't have to pay a lot of money to slaughter cows and then just slaughter from the exponential growth. That's my strategy. Is it normal that I see what you're doing on that? Oh, then I hooked the game up wrong. <laughs> okay. Can I submit? Yeah, so now okay. you see I'm waiting for the other players to submit. They hit submit. Yes. Uh, but if I set us, okay. And now because we all agreed that time is ready to move forward, time moves forward. So there are a couple of different time advancement techniques that you can use in a multiplayer game. Um, you can do it on consensus. You can do it with a timer. You can do it by a single role having that power. You know, so imagine uh, we were playing a cooperative game. We could have the president make the decision for time to move forward. Or you can do it, um, you know, some combination there above, or something that we don't support but when they want to, is uh, the ability for a facilitator who isn't actually a part of the game to advance everybody in the class forward at once. So this is as far as I'm going to go for the moment, but you'll see here, you know, you've seen the main screens in this game. So what I'm going to show you how to do initially is build the screens. So that's all stuff that's applicable to building a single player game, because uh, normally we would have two workshops, one build a single player game, one build a multiplayer game. So I'm crunching, I'm merging the two of them together. So I want to make sure that those of you who aren't super familiar with the architect and what it can do, realize uh, that it can do much more than multiplayer games. It can do single user learning environments as well. So all the skills you learned today are applicable to that. And then we're actually gonna go ahead and make this a multiplayer game and end with publishing it without making mistakes so that Nato can see the decisions that I make. <laughs> Alrighty. So uh, now's the part where we can all work together. So thank you, Nato and Benjamin. Okay, thank you. So uh, the first thing uh, I'm gonna do is uh, launch architect. And I guess it's just very slow on this computer. You were right, Bob. This is going to make me slow down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'm going to open up uh, the tragedy of the common file um, in the multiplayer folder, not the one called finished. Okay. You're right. It's all over. Okay, so um, you can see the way that I've basically structured this model. It's not terribly important, um, but what you can see here is uh, that I've got a series of arrays. Um, so in this case, I have everything arrayed by farmer. I have three farmers, um, and that way, so I didn't have to copy and paste the structure three times, I just used an array. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room remembers Powerson Constructor, where you had to make decisions about how to build multiplayer games, whether or not they were going to be symmetric or asymmetric. Okay, that's good. Um, so you can build a multiplayer game without using arrays. It's not required. It makes your life easier, um, but it's definitely not required. Um, you tend to build uh, multiplayer games with arrays when they're competitive. Um, because all of the players typically have the same set of structure and the same sets of decisions, and you make the thing which is going to be the roles, the array. Um, but when you're building a cooperative game, all that goes out the window, um, and it really is just you know one shared general model. Um, but in this case, since it's cooperative as I structured it, I've got uh, arrays. So as you can see, I have a little bit of stock and flow structure here. I have uh, cows that are, um, uh, can be born, cows that die according to a lifespan. They have a normal lifespan. But when the field gets very uh, dense, filled with lots of cows, um, there's less grass per cow, which means um, we knock the lifespan of the cows down because they're not able to eat enough. Um, Grass grows according to a very simple exponential curve and uh, dies not on its own volition, but only because it is eaten by cows. Um, so the field, um, the only outflow from the field is eating. Um, we then keep track of everything on this side is just the, uh, the money. So there is a little bit of a market going on depending upon uh, the number of cows on the field. Um, that sets what the price is 
um, to buy a cow or what the price is when you slaughter a cow. And we track all that uh, to develop a profit and then sum it for a cumulative profit. So the model's fairly basic. Um, and if you're curious about it, I'm happy to explain more, but it's definitely no work of art. To get to the interface, we hit uh, the thing on the upper right-hand corner of the screen that looks like the presentation mode icon in PowerPoint. So Architect is constructed of two main screens. So uh, everything up until today has been done in the model window. We're now gonna be working in the interface window. Um, what's really nice when you have two monitors is you can put one window on each monitor so you can be looking at your model as you're building your interface. Unfortunately, I have about I don't know, it looks like 800 pixels on this entire monitor, so I can't see anything that I'm doing. Anyway, um, so now we're looking at uh, our interface design screen, and you'll see uh, that it more or less uh, looks like PowerPoint. We have a list of pages or slides on the left. Um, we have a big canvas. Uh, how did you get to the um, You go ahead and you hit the button that looks like this. That doesn't ask you. No. So all the way at the, the far end of the toolbar oh. is a button that says open interface window. Yeah. No, is, this, is there somebody who doesn't have an interface window open? Is there anybody who's got the finished model open instead of the beginning model? All right. So you can have the finished model open and look at these things as I demonstrate them and they'll be done already. Um, if you want to follow along though, choose not the finished model. All right, so we've got uh, the area where we can drag and drop content. We've got uh, the listing of our pages here on the left. The order of these pages is irrelevant. The only way that you navigate between pages is by putting down buttons or other widgets that control navigation. Um, and that has nothing to do with the order that the pages appear in this panel over here. And you'll see exactly what that looks like um, as we start building out this simulation. Can you reorder them if you want to? Sure. It just it doesn't affect anything except the order in that list. Like a PowerPoint. <laughs> right. Like yeah, a PowerPoint. Yeah. Unlike PowerPoint, because in PowerPoint, the order matters. When you make the presentation and you hit the next button, you go from this page to this page, then this page to this page. What I'm saying is in Architect, when you design your interface, it's not linear. It can go in any of a million branching directions. So you can go from page one. It's like, uh, did you ever read like uh, these like choose your own adventure storybooks where you would get to the end of the page and it would say, go to page 47 if you want Sarah to live. Go to page, sorry, that was not my <laughs> Go to page 48 if you want Bob to continue chasing her. Uh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> so that's what blushing feels like. All right. Uh, so you can order them the way that you the way that you logically think about them. Can you right. go back and forth in the game back to a previous game? Yes, yes. So you'll see all that when we start putting down buttons and things like that, which we're actually going to get to super quick. Um, so just like on uh, you know the model layer, we have a panel here, which you can hide and close using this triangle. Um, so remember that triangle. It's your friend. When you're looking for your settings, look for the triangle. Um, and the first thing we want to do is set up our page size. So the first thing that you ever do when you're ever building an interactive learning environment is you say in your head, who's using my game? Are they students? Are they professionals? Do they have giant workstations with 40 inch monitors? Are they running on a mobile phone? Are they on an iPad? All of that just makes uh, sets the stage for the kinds of decisions you need to make in terms of design. That's your job as an author, is to design content that fits the devices of your audience. So in addition to all of your jobs in terms of you know, designing engaging content and designing content uh, that's pedagogically sound and designing content that actually teaches somebody something, you also have to make sure that you design content that works for the devices that people are going to use it on. And uh, when you're developing an interface, page size is pretty much the lever you have to choose. So we give you a bunch of uh, you know, built-in uh, presets um, with different aspect ratios and things like that. In this case, I'm gonna choose wide desktops and tablets. 
And I'm going to go into this resizable options, and I'm going to show you something that 99.99999% of you should always check and then forget about. Um, and the 0.001% of you who don't want to do this, you'll email me afterwards and we'll discuss. But essentially, you always want to zoom content to fit space. So what that means is you'll design your sim to work at you know 1066 by 600. But if somebody comes and uses your simulation on a 40 inch monitor, it will zoom everything in so that it takes up as much space as possible so that it expands across the entire screen. Or if somebody comes and uses your simulation on a phone, it'll zoom all the way out so that they don't have to scroll around. So the thing you're trying to make sure that users don't do is scroll. As a simulation author, or as a game author, users don't scroll. If your stuff scrolls, they're never gonna see what's behind that scroll bar. They're just not gonna get there. Um, so by checking that option off, it makes sure that your sim doesn't scroll. All right, so Diana, you got a question? No, thank you. Okay. All right, so now that we've set up our page size, um, we're gonna do one more thing that we don't normally do, and that's only because I made a mistake when I took the finished interface and turned it into the start interface. I forgot and I left the simulation event here and we all need to delete it so that we can actually go remake it again. So what I need you to do is um, when you're looking at the interface settings, I want you to click uh, the message bubble with the exclamation point and then I want you to hit remove selected so that your box is empty because we need to make that later on. I need to show you how simulation events works. So the way I made all this material was I built the game and then I deleted everything and I forgot to delete that. All right, step one, <laughs> we need to build the first page of this game. Uh, so if you remember from when we were playing this game, the first page was a little home page, it had a nice title on it, it had some descriptive text about what tragedy of the commons was, and it had a picture of some cows. So let's build that introductory screen. These are the kinds of skills that you'll use, the mechanical kinds of skills that you'll use when you're building single player games. There's nothing here so far that I've said that has anything to do with multiplayer. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make the text box which represents the title of my game that's gonna appear on the top of all of the pages. I'm gonna choose the text tool by clicking on it and then clicking again to place it and then I can type directly in this box. Okie dokie. So I've now created a bunch of text. If I wanted to edit it again, I can double click and the panel will open up and I can edit it right here. Or I can double click on the box and edit it right there in place on, excuse me, the canvas. Um, in this case, I just want to keep it as plain text. Rich text would allow me to set you know, different words to be bold or italicized or colors or things like that, but I don't need any of that fancy stuff. I'm leaving it as plain text. If you remember in the game that we were playing, the text was big. So we always wanna go um, to our style settings. The style settings are represented always by the paint roller. So architect and even professional has a cascading set of styles. What, that, what I mean by that is you can set styles to the highest level, software defaults. And every model that you create after you set your software default will inherit that. You can then override that in your model. So anytime you see the paint roller went in uh, the model or interface settings panels, um, there isn't one here, um, you can set it and it'll take care of everything at the model level. You can then set styles on specific objects. So you can see that these things cascade. They go from the really broad level all the way down to the very specific. And so you can use that to make your life easier so you don't have to change the styles on hundreds of objects all at the end. How do you do the soft edit? Like how do you set it as a soft edit? Uh, that's edit default settings. Okay. Okie dokie. So I'm gonna set my styles uh, for the text. I don't want it to be size 12. I want it to be size 28. Uh, I'm going to make it bold, and then I'm actually, i got to zoom out in order for me to see, um, unfortunately. So things are going to get a little small for you guys. Um, so now I can see my whole interface, and I'm going to get uh, this text box somewhere near the top uh, left, extend it 
all the way over. That way, when I double click on it now, I can center it, and I end up with something that's reasonably in the center of the page. Okay. If I wanted to control exactly where the text box appeared on the page, in that style panel, there's a little collapsible box here. So what we've done um, in new in Architect 1.7 is try to declutter the panels and take away some of the more obtrusive settings and leave you with only the most important things. So if you wanted to, for instance, set the exact pixel locations of this text, you could by hitting this triangle, which opens it up, which allows you to adjust um, to any degree of accuracy um, the X and Y position and the width and height of any element on the screen. Okie dokie, so we've made our title. The next thing we're gonna do is put in our image. To put in an image, we use the graphics tool. I get that down, and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger by dragging on the squares. Um, there's still no image in here because we haven't told it what image we want it to show. I double click, and it remembers what panel you were looking at last. So I was looking at the style panel last, so I put the style panel on the front. So if you ever see that and you're not expecting, go back to the wrench, which represents settings, and you'll get all of the settings for the object. So styles tend to be things that affect appearance, color, and fonts, and things like that. Settings are uh, attributes of the object. In this case, I'm going to import this image from a file, and I'm gonna go um, to the thumb drive, into the workshop folder, multiplayer, graphics, and cows. And then I'm gonna take a breath and make sure you all got there. Yes. Is there anybody who isn't looking at some cows? <laughs> Very nice. Awesome, all right, we're all looking at cows. So the next thing we can do now is we can play with some of the options for the image. Uh, we can size it to fit the frame so that the image resizes to fit the general size of the box we give it. Uh, which then allows us to potentially unfix the aspect ratio to stretch the cows so we can make some funny looking cows. Don't uncheck that. Cows like to be, um, you know, their appropriate width and height. Um, and then if we wanted to, we could embed this in the file. Um, what that means is this image would then be directly included in the X file, which is the file format that we use uh, to save our models. This will make your model huge, but will make it a lot easier to share the model. Ultimately, the best thing to do is what I did on this thumb drive. You'll notice how I had the, in, the, the image in a folder called graphics. Um, so there's a special folder name called graphics. When you put it next to the model, you can put all of your images in there. And Architect knows to look in that graphics folder for any images that you're using. Uh, another folder with a fancy name like that is video. So if you've got any videos, put it in a folder called video. Um, and Architect will always know to look for your video in the video folder. That folder needs to be on the same place as your model. Correct. Always right next to your model. Okay. Okie dokie. So now we've got our picture of our cows. And the next thing we want to do is put in all the text, you know, that descriptive text. Um, so I'm going to hit the text box again, click again to place it. But this time I'm just going to size the box to be nice and big. And I'll make a kind of like two column layout here. Um, again, this isn't gonna be the most beautiful game we've ever built, uh, but it's gonna be functional. So if you go back to your thumb drive in the uh, Windows Explorer, um, and you go into, what am I looking at here? Uh, workshop, multiplayer, you'll see this uh, text file called intro.text. Uh -huh. You can open this up, control A to select it all, control C to copy it. Oh, just to be clear, yeah, very many. This is okay. just text off of Wikipedia. It's uh, <laughs> irrelevant. Better than Laura Ipsum text. Multiplier. Intro text. Intro text. Okay. Open it up in your systems text editor, copy it, and put it on the clipboard. There you go. Okay. And then I've opened up the panel now. So hopefully you've all opened up that little text file, you've grabbed the text, put it on your clipboard, opened up the panel, and you can paste it right here. Uh -huh. And I'm gonna paste it. Okay. And we see now that we get some nice uh, formatted text. 
When I click out of this box, when I move the focus out of this text area, you'll see that the interface updates with the text. Right. So the way that a lot of these form fields work in Architect is you type a bunch of stuff, you focus somewhere else, the screen updates. Mm -hmm. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna format this stuff as rich text. And the reason why I wanna format it as rich text is because uh, I wanna demonstrate to you just basically how this works. Wonderful. So I can take this word, this uh, word like uh, over exploitation, and I can emphasize it by making it bold and italic and underlined. I can make it a slightly bigger font. Wonderful. And now I click away, and we see that we get the tragedy of the commons is one way of accounting for over exploitation. Okay. So we emphasized it. All right. Very cool. So we're all happy now with images, text, and rich text. Good. The next thing we need to learn is page navigation. Are you ready? Ready. The first thing we need to do is make a page to navigate to. So we go down to the bottom of Architect and we hit the green plus. I think you'll begin to get used to this green plus. That means add things. And uh, we're gonna add a page after I fix my name tag. And we've added a page. By default, the page goes next and it gets a name according to its position in the list. We're gonna go back to our original page by clicking on it. And I'm gonna hide my panel so I can see this bottom right hand corner. Um, so the general way that you want to put your buttons, especially your navigation content, you want it to be um, in pretty much the same exact spot across all pages. Um, if you're not using a standard layout structure, like either uh, you know a set of tabs or a set of you know menus running down the side, um, the next place where users will look, the most common place where users will look for a button, is down here. Uh -huh. Up here is where you tend to put your logos. Uh -huh. This is dead space, nobody looks here. <laughs> um, and this is where you put like uh, help and information and things like that. Yes. So don't put anything important down here, nobody looks here. Like, right. Okay. <laughs> right. So now we're gonna learn about the button. Uh -huh. All right, so the button is the first widget, it's the most important widget. And why is the button the most important widget? It lets us perform actions. Uh -huh. Buttons are like our verbs. So we put down our button by clicking on it and clicking again, and we get what is this, uh, now I think it's a fairly ugly button. At one point I thought it was a fairly pretty button. I should file a complaint with the developer and tell them to fix it. Um, so how did you make the button? I pressed uh, the button item, um, the first one in the upper left, clicked once, and then clicked again. So requirement change. Yeah. So I'm gonna select the button, double click on it, and we're gonna take a look at its panel. So we can set a whole lot of things on the button. The reason why the button has a lot of settings is because the button is a very important object. You will use buttons all the time. Mm. Buttons can look like anything though. Uh, we've made buttons pretty flexible in that respect. And I'm gonna go through all the settings in the button because I think it's really important. Um, you can set a label, an icon, where the icon appears in the button. You can set a series of actions. Um, so all of the things this button can do are in this drop-down box. Uh, this button can run the model, pause the model, resume the model, stop the model. It can start or stop still alive. Wow. It can simulate the model as quickly as possible. That's what ballistic mode means. <laughs> like a bullet. Don't wait. Go. Advance it just as quickly or create a new run. It can restore all the data out of the model, so clear it all and reset it to the beginning, or just reset all of the decisions, that's inputs, or reset all of the outputs, that's all your graphs and tables. A button can import data from a spreadsheet, even in a published simulation. It can export data to the clipboard in spreadsheet format, even when published to the internet. It can set decisions in the model, it can navigate to a page, it can navigate to a story, it can go to another link, or all of the things that we'll do today, um, it can uh, mark the player as ready to begin the game or ready to take the next step in the game. Button's a good object to know about. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this button navigate to a page. 
And when it navigates to a page, we then need to choose, well, what page are we going to? Mm -hmm. So this goes, Janet, to your question you earlier, can you go you know, in order between the pages? Yes, you can go to the next page or the previous page, or you can go to the last page that you visited, or you could go to the home page, mm -hmm. um, or you could go to a specific page, in mm -hmm. this case, page two. Mm -hmm. Okie dokie. We generate by default a label for that button, which is the name of the page. If we want to override that label, we can type it in on the top, and uh, we want it to say, let's play. Cool. All righty. So now, let's take a look at some of the styling options. Oh, sorry. When you say uh, we can tell it to go to a specific page, if yes. we move the pages around, does it remember which yes. page it was? Yes. So page two is the title of this page. So let's actually, let's make this real concrete. Um, I can go to page two. All of you go to page two with me. I can go to the interface settings and scroll all the way to the bottom, and I can change the name of this page, and I can call it Dashboard. Uh -huh. And when I come back to the home page and I click on the button, it's now navigating to the Dashboard. So it knows exactly, it keeps that link to the specific page you wanted to go to, no matter where that page ends up. That's why the order in here is not important. Okie dokie. So let's go back and let's style this button. So this is how I like to style my buttons nowadays, but this gives you an idea of what you can do with them. You can make them transparent and just put them over an image if you wanted to. Um, I like them with a flat background and a highlight on mouse over. So you go to your style for the button, check off flat background, highlight on mouse over, and then we're gonna change the background color. And I want the background color for my button to be, I don't remember, blue. And then we want the highlight color to be green. I don't know, make it real bright. I don't know if this is the best design, probably isn't, but I'm just demonstrating how this works. And I want my font not to be black anymore, but white. I want it to be bold, and I want it to be size 14. We want things to be legible. And then I'm gonna zoom in so that we can see our button a little bit better. And then I'm gonna make this button a heck of a lot bigger. All right. And then I'm gonna just- Excuse the color of the text. White. But how's where? Um, it's right below the size. Uh oh. So now, let's take a look and see how this works and what this is like. Great. To preview, we can come up here and we can go either, yeah, we'll just go directly to presentation mode. And we can see now that we've got a pretty interface. And when we roll over this button, it changed to bright green. That way people know. Uh -huh. They're ready to click on it. Uh -huh. How do you get to presentation mode? Uh -huh. To get to presentation mode, you go to the toolbar and you hit the thing that looks like the PowerPoint presentation. There's a drop down arrow next to it. There's three different ways you can present your work. Full screen, in a window, or in experiment mode. Experiment mode allows you, um, keeps you in this exact same interface so you can see the full listing of pages and things like that. It's good for quick tests. Window presentation mode is good to see how your SIM resizes, because you can resize the window and the SIM will adjust its size to match exactly what it would look like if the monitor was as big as the window. Um, but full screen is what you do when you're in front of a room full of people. When you're in full screen or any of the presentation modes, no longer are your clicks interpreted to edit your content, they're interpreted to actually interact with your content. Mm -hmm. So when I click on a button, it actually does the action of the button. Mm -hmm. And it navigates me to this blank page. All right. So the next thing I'm gonna teach you about is templates. Um, because I'm gonna to begin to speed up a little bit progressively the development of this interface, because I'm just watching the clock. 
Um, what we want to do now is we want to develop a template. So if you remember the interface that we were playing before, it always had that title on the top of the page. So rather than putting that title on the top of every page, I'm going to put it on the equivalent of a slide master, mm -hmm. and I'm going to use that slide master on all the rest of the pages in my interface. So let's go ahead and go back to our first page. Let's grab that title, Control X to cut. Uh huh. Go to the context and change it to templates. Uh huh. Don't click anywhere over here. Don't do it. Uh huh. <laughs> Hit Control V. Yes. The reason why we do it like that is if you click, it's going to alter the position where the item pastes. If you don't click, it will paste exactly where it was on the page where you took it from. So now this title is exactly where it was on the first page. I'm sorry, where did, how do you get to that template? You go to this menu on the top that says context. There are three contexts. There's the interface, there are your templates, and then your, there are your stories. Unfortunately, today we won't get, have time to get into stories. If you mistakenly click up on the canvas and your text box isn't where you left it, drag it back to where it once was. And then I'm going to go back to the interface context. And you'll see that the title has shown up. And the reason that the title has shown up is because this page is using template one. You can change what template it uses. You know, it can use no template and the title disappears. Template one, the title appears. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna set up the rest of the pages in our simulation. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we'll do one more thing that's uh, still applicable to single player and then we're gonna start getting multiplayer. So for those of you who are interested in multiplayer, you can almost turn your brain off. <laughs> can you add like home buttons and stuff to the template as well? Yeah, you can add anything you want to the template. Okay, wonderful. Anything. Wonderful. In fact, you want to put as many things as you possibly can on the template so you don't have to continuously cut and paste them throughout the rest of your interface. And why do you want to do that? Because when you make a mistake, because I always make mistakes, you can fix them in one place rather than in 50 places. But you can also have templates that have templates, that have templates, that have templates. So if you want, <laughs> we're actually gonna do a tiny bit of that today. Um, so you can see that a template can have a template, and then you can use that template in other places. That way when you make a mistake, you fix it all the way in the beginning, and you don't have to fix it in all of the other 50 places. So when we use a template, it's very important that you realize you can no longer interact with the thing that's on the template. Ah, I can't select that. Why can't I select that? that it's on the that. template. Yes. When it's on the template, it's on the template. And how did you get it on the template? Because mine did not show up. Um, so what you do is you go to the interface context, you go to templates, you put it here. After you've done that, you go back to the interface, you open up the panel, scroll all the way to the bottom, to the selected page settings, and you make sure that the current page is using that template. What do you mean, I put it there, I copy and paste it? Yes. Uh, gotcha. I mean, you can put things on templates without copy and paste, I just did it this way. Because normally, you don't have the foresight to know what belongs on a template and what doesn't. You design a page, it looks real good, and you say, oh, well, I want to use that other places. So you cut, paste onto a template without clicking on the template. Okay. Very important to remember, don't click on the template when you're pasting, that way everything goes exactly where you had it and then you apply the template to the page where you started. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna design our dashboard now. And so we know we want the title on this page. So let's use template one, and we get our title for free. And if you remember on the dashboard, we had a series of four graphs. And so what we're gonna do is we are going to create them. We're gonna click on the graph tool. We're gonna place it down. I'm gonna zoom out so that I can see my whole sim. Um, and I'm gonna make it nice and big. And I'm gonna start going through creating these graphs. The first graph I wanna make is an area graph. Area graphs are used to show stacked results. 
Um, it's a stacked area graph. Um, in this case, I'm only gonna put a single series on it, so it doesn't matter anyway. Um, but the variable I wanna put, I'm gonna use the green plus to select, is uh, oh. total herd size. Oh. And now we have a nice area chart. Total, okay. Herd total, okay. size, total. all the cows in the field. Oh, yeah. Then you'll see at the top of this panel, there's a plus button. So um, Stella has this concept of stacks of output items. You got a stack of graphs, you know, many of them all stacked up in a flip book. Um, and you can uh, choose what you want to be the next page in the stack. It could be another graph or it could be a table. So that's a new thing in 1.7. In this case, I'm gonna add another graph. And the default way that we visualize this as uh, is as two arrows to show the previous and show the next page. That's not my favorite. My favorite is tabs. Okay. So when I come back here now, you see that I have a set of tabs for each one of the pages in my graph. And on this second graph, I'm gonna put um, the variable called grass. Second tab. So it'll say page two of two on top. That's how you know you're on your second one. I'm putting grass, and I'm gonna make it an area chart again. Area again? Okay. Yep, so now you say, and well, Billy, this grass. is really confusing. I have two tabs that say graph. What the hey? Users don't know what the heck that is. So let's fix it. The graph panel is the most complex panel in the software. There is the most options in it. So we had to break it into two. It has series settings and then settings, settings. Very descriptive. Um, and then our styles. So let's go into our settings, settings. And we can change the title of this graph and we'll call this one grass. And you'll notice that all that automatically the selection label updates to say grass, but if we wanted the tab to say something else, we can do that. Now the tab says something else, but I'm just gonna leave it as grass. Uh, excuse me, where is the graph options? Okay, it's okay. It's the second I find, tab in yes. the middle. Okay, I find it. Okay. okay. If we want to edit our first graph, we use these buttons to navigate through the list. So we can go back to the first page and we can make the same changes. We could say uh, total herd size. It's cool. So now our tabs are set up. Then I'm going to add a new graph type. And I'm going to purposely make a mistake here. I'm going to add this graph in the middle. I want you to all add the graph in the middle so that we can all correct my mistake. Um, and on this graph, I want to put, um, this will be market prices. And we're going to go back to the list of series and we're going to leave this as a line graph. And we're going to put two series on it. The first is um, price paid for a cow. And the second one is cost to buy a cow. Cost of a cow. Uh, the price is uh, It's irrelevant, I mean, it's relevant for the game, of course, what shows up in your graphs. It's not super relevant to knowing how to build a multiplayer game, what shows up in your graphs. This next thing is important though. So, I put this tab in the wrong position. I don't want market price in the middle. I want it at the end. How do I reorder? the items in my stack. I do that by hitting this up and down button, and I can drag and drop these items to change the order. Now it's total herd size grass, then market prices. Okay. Let's say um, I wanted to make all of the graphs a bit more similar. I can hit this button, which selects all of them, uh huh. Um, hold on, I gotta unselect all of them. This button. I can come then over to the styles, 
and I can check off, you know, hide or show border, or, you know, let's actually apply some settings. Let's make uh, the title big. Let's make that size 16. Let's make the axis title and legends size 14, and the axis labels size 12. So now I changed that for all three graphs at once. I didn't have to click into each individual graph and change it again and again and again. Three clicks is better than nine. Okie dokie. We've now got our graph set up. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we've got, uh, I'll do one more thing and then we'll be done with single player. At this point, I can put down a button in the lower right hand corner of this page I can double click on it and I can add an action. And the action will be to run the model. And when I go to present this interface now, I get behavior and I can run this game uh, to make a run button. You put a button down. Do you run or what? No, just run. The, Action for the button yes. is run, the first action in the list. Uh, first action. Okay. I present, and now I can run this model. We built a single player game now. It's not very interesting, but we could take this and we could publish this to the exchange. Through a fairly simple process that we're going to show at the end. Now we're going to start making this multiplayer. All right, so to make a multiplayer game, we need to go into um, the settings and configure our multiplayer options. So here's our multiplayer options. When we check this checkbox on the top, we are now into multiplayer land. Excuse me. Um... That's right here, configure multiplayer options. It's right in your interface settings. Interface settings. I'm going to enable multiplayer. And now it gives me choices. I can include chat or not include chat. So if you remember, you, I should have demonstrated this when we played the game. In the upper left hand corner was a, what's called a hamburger button, a button that has three lines that looks like a hamburger. If you open that button, we could have all chatted to each other, but I didn't do it. Uh, in this case, I want chat in the game. The next thing you set is the pause interval for multiplayer. So if you remember, we all made a decision and we all agreed that the game was ready to move forward. But how far forward? One time unit, seven time units, 36 time units. That's what you type into this box. In this case, we want this game to move forward in steps of four. So we're gonna move forward four time units every time all of the players in our game agree the time should move forward. So if your mo my model's running in months, so we're gonna move forward uh, four months. That's really awkward. Probably should be three. Why don't we make it three? <laughs> we'll move forward a quarter, not a third. Who? I guess if you go to a college with trimesters, you look at the year and thirds, but anyway, enough silly. All right, so now we've uh, set up that part. Now we need to create the roles. So we need to create um, the little chicklets that each one of us is gonna click on um, in order to determine what position we take in the game. So we're gonna name each one of the roles. The first role I'm gonna call Farmer One. And this is pretty basic stuff. Um, each role needs its own unique number. Just give them one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the only reason this is exposed is because one day we'll do some pretty cool stuff with it, but one day isn't today, and uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, um, the next thing you need to control is what is their start page. So you can set it up so that all of the roles each have a different beginning page in your interface so that um, you know the president can't read the job description for the Secretary of Defense. But in this case, we're all starting at the same page called home page. The next thing uh, we could set up is a variable that gets set in the model to either zero or one if the player is present or not present. This is the switch you can use to make automated players. 
So you can say, if whatever variable I put in that box is one, then don't make any decisions automatically for the player. Else, do something that's computer generated for that player. That's how you make an optional role work. That's all I'm gonna say about optional roles. I'm gonna mark this role as required for the game to start. No? Start stage says home page and home. Um, so home is this one that we named as home. And what's next? The home page is um, the default page that the simulation starts. Um, I'll show you where that setting is in, in the interface settings. It's confusing because we called the first page in our simulation home. Mm -hmm. um, we should have called it, I don't know, the place that we start. I don't know, something not home. <laughs> Okay, so we need to make our three farmer rolls. So we're gonna go through that fairly quickly now. Farmer two. Farmer two. And farmer three. Farmer three. Since we don't have any optional rolls, we don't care whether or not uh, they're present or not, so we're not gonna give the system variables to set to tell us. Mm -hmm. But if you care, you should set. Um, the next thing at the bottom of this, um, it's fairly basic, um, but it looks complicated. So you remember when we start, when we were playing that game and we got to all those screens that said, oh, join the game and you know, enter your nickname and all that, and you know how we had the title that said Tragedy of the Commons at top? Mm -hmm. The way we got the Tragedy of the Commons at top was by applying one of our templates to those pages. You don't have any design control over those pages besides what's on a template. So we can use our template on that page and uh, because I know, because I looked at it, um, our text is about 80 pixels from the top of the page, so we need to tell it, you know, hey system, don't put any content in the first 80 pixels of the page. Leave that as empty space. Don't make that box, that list of games cover our title. And then to balance it so that it looks balanced and not awkward, we put 80, pages, uh, 80 pixels uh, on the bottom. The way you'll do that for your own sims is by going um, to the template, measuring where this ends up by looking at the size and position and saying it starts at uh, 22, then has a height of 58, uh, 27 and 58, and that's about 80. So don't put any content over that. Yeah. All right, so now we've created our roles. And what we need to do now is uh, set up our navigation from this dashboard. So if you remember, Nato, Benjamin, and myself, we all were looking at the exact same dashboard. It was only when we clicked on that button that said, um, you know, make decisions, that it brought us to a page that was unique for all of the three of us. So let's go ahead and create some destination pages that we can make unique for the three of us. So I'm going to quickly add three pages. Add a page, add a page, add a page. I'm going to open up the interface settings and I'm going to name the pages. This last one that I made is going to be called Farmer 3. The second one, Farmer 2. And the first one, Farmer 1. Okie dokie, so we've got our three farmer pages. Yes. We want our three farmer pages um, to have uh, some basic content on them. Okay. We want it to have a graph of the herd size and a graph of the cumulative profit and the metrics on how much a uh, cow costs and how much uh, you get paid for a cow. So we'll, I think, uh, because let me, I know, we got about, what, 30 minutes left? Yes. I'm gonna skimp a little. I'm just gonna put on this page the cumulative profit. And so this is the technique that I use to build nearly symmetric interfaces. And what I mean by that is that uh, each one of the players has content that looks pretty much the same. So I'm gonna put uh, a big graph down and it's gonna have uh, the cumulative profit on it. So I'm gonna use the green plus, and I'm gonna choose the cumulative profit stock, and then I'm gonna do something weird. I'm gonna keep the star here. 
so that I get cumulative profit for all three of the plans. Mm -hmm. Even though this is on Farmer 1's page and we don't want Farmer 1 um, to ever know what's going on with Farmer 2 and Farmer 3, we're gonna set up our page so that it's correct for all three players. We're gonna copy that whole page content and paste it and paste it. Then we're just gonna delete the other players off the other page. That way you don't have to consistently recreate things over and over and over again. We couldn't do it in Correct. So the templates only work by putting the same exact content on all of the pages. But all of the content on these pages is going to be slightly different. On this page, we're going to be looking at a graph of cumulative profit for Farmer 1, cumulative profit for Farmer 2, cumulative profit for Farmer 3. The other advantage to doing it like this is when I use the star, it um, makes a different color line for each one of the players. So when I delete the other two players, I'm left with a color that's unique for each player. So that I, as a teacher, can walk around in the room and tell by looking at the color what farmer number each person is. Whereas if I were to put a new graph down on every page, it would always have a blue line at first. And so farmer one would be blue, and farmer two would be blue, and farmer three would be blue. And I'd be standing in the back of the room where Sarah is and saying, boy, you're all farmer, huh? You know, that way, when you're blue, I know you're farmer one. When you're red, I know you're farmer two. When you're pink, I know you're farmer three. Okie dokie. So in Perfidy, you don't have the question mark function that was available in Simulate? No. Oh, you, you remember that. <laughs> yeah, very well. <laughs> I highly used it. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have that yet. Because well, I have to do um, about 12 pages, so that's a different <laughs> yeah. compared to three. <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately there's some labor involved. Um, all right, so I've created my cumulative profit here. Um, I guess we could do one more graph. What the heck? Um, and in this graph, uh, we'll put our uh, total herd size. Um, so that's herd, not I said total. I meant the regular herd. Um, and again, there's a herd for each of the three farmers. Is this a separate? Different graph? Yeah, I, after all that uh, hemming and hawing about we're only going to do one graph, I said that. Ah, we'll just do it. Um, and so now we've got a page that uh, that looks pretty weird. You know, we're missing our content on the top. You know, we've got uh, you know too much information in these graphs. So the, the the way to make this technique work best is to make this page its best before we duplicate it. Mm -hmm. So we want to go through now and we want to do the following things. We want to remove the legend because we're not going to have multiple series on each one of the graphs. We want to give each one of the graphs the appropriate name. Right now I'm editing um, the herd size graph, so I'm going to have the title be herd size. And we're going to make um, some similar changes to graph settings. I should have unfortunately done this as a global set of settings as opposed to individually on each of the graphs, but I want to make the title um, size 16, the axis title text size 14, and the axis label size 12. And I'm going to go back to this graph. I'm going to do the same thing. I should have used the global settings. Oh well. 16, 14, 12. 16, 14, 12. And then I'm going to change the title of this graph from the word graph to cumulative profit. Cumulative profits. And I'm going to make sure there's no legend. Then I'm going to put down my two decision inputs. In this case, I'm going to use uh, the knob. So the way that the tools on the top of the page are organized, um, the first set of widgets are all of your annotations. Um, they beautify your interface or they let you do actions or things like that. The next grouping is all of your output devices from graphs to tables to numeric displays which show you instantaneous values to traffic lights, the speedometers, to the animation widget or spatial map. Those are more complicated widgets which we have webinars on, which you should watch if you're interested. 
Um, then the next set of widgets is all input devices like sliders, knobs, text-based input, switches, radio buttons, a draggable pie chart, um, and then tabular uh, input is the last thing. Okie dokie. So I want to create uh, two knobs. So I'm going to click the knob tool, click the press, and set, you know, set the settings for the knob. And uh, the, what I want this knob to control is to purchase um, the number of cows to purchase. So that's going to be cows ordered. Unfortunately, I can't use the star trick here. Here again, the question mark would work good here, but I don't have it. So this is gonna be cows ordered for farmer number one. Whenever you use a knob or a slider or any other ranged input device, mm -hmm. always, always, and with me, always. always set your minimum and maximum. The software will give you minimums and maximums. They're not good, don't use them. <laughs> I can tell you, I made them. <laughs> They're not good, don't use them. So we're gonna use, uh, go from zero to 100. And we're going to go in increments of one. And we're going to title this as cow um, orders or two orders. And then if you remember, we made a decision when we were designing this game that every time we all agreed to advance, it was going to go forward by three time units. So we don't want to order this number of cows every single month in the quarter. We want to do it just once. So the user is going to make the decision, the orders are going to be processed, and then the number of orders we want to go back to zero. Otherwise, we'd be ordering 30 cows in March, 30 cows in April, 30 cows in May, um, which would be 90 cows when they asked for 30. So we're going to reset this decision at the end of each DT. <coughs> Right. I want to make this a little bigger. Yeah. Would it make more sense to reset it every at the end of every time unit? Because if you run it in like months and DT would be I don't know sixteen. Yeah, we could do that too. I no, think I have this as a DT of one. Oh, if your DT is one. Okay. I think I think it's really dumb like that. Um, I don't remember. Let's see. DT of one. There we go. It's silly. So it's functionally equivalent. So I'm going to copy this knob and paste this knob again. Uh, when you're building interfaces, your goal is to be a fat, lazy slob and do as little work as possible. So copy and paste is your friend. So we're going to change this from cows ordered to cows slaughtered for the first farmer. And we're going to change the label from to order to be to slaughter. And we're going to put a uh, button down. And again, um, we're fat, lazy slobs, so we're going to copy that button off the first page of the interface. We'll go back to the page called home, grab this nicely formatted button called let's play, copy it with control C. Don't click on the canvas. Control V, so it ends up in exactly the same spot. Okay. We're gonna take this button and we're gonna change the title from Let's Play to I'm Ready. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to get an apostrophe on this computer and I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, and uh, instead of navigating to a page, this button is going to make the user ready to advance. So when Farmer 1 clicks this button, Farmer 1 is going to move forward in time. What's the difference between ready to advance and ready to start? Ready to start is begin a whole new game. Wipe everything out and start all over. Ready to advance is move forward those three time units. I'm going to take this I'm ready button and I'm going to copy it and paste it. That way there's an easy way to get back to the dashboard. And the two buttons are going to look similar. 
And I'm going to double click it and instead of ready to advance, navigate to page, dashboard. Mm. And just delete the label altogether and the button label will change to the name of the page. Dashboard. Because that's the name of the page you're going to. Dashboard. dashboard. Yep. Did you make, uh, what's the page uh, that you made that has total herd size, grass, and market prices? To so that page. You may have called it page two. Oh, and that's supposed to be called dashboard? Yep. Sarah can show you how to change no, its name. I know how to, I know how to Okay, cool. Things. All right, then the next, the final thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put a uh, numeric display down, which is gonna show the instantaneous value um, for cow prices. That's the number, you know, eight widget. Click it. Green plus, um, I forgot the name of this variable. Okay, the variable is called cost of a cow. Cost of a cow. There's this little checkbox here that says update on user input when paused. Let me explain that real quick. When that thing is checked, what that means is decisions that users make will be reflected in that value. That way, let's imagine we were doing a budget allocation yeah. game. If you wanted to show players what the total amount of money that was going to be spent next turn is, you would want that value to update on input when paused. But if you wanted it to be a secret that they overshot the budget, you would leave it unchecked. In this case, we want it to be a secret what the price of cows is gonna be in the next time step, so we leave it unchecked. And then, uh, let me show you how to style this thing real quick. Um, I like uh, to change the color to white, and then change the font size to 12 and make it a bit bigger, and now it's pretty easy to read. I'm gonna copy it, paste it. And this one, I'm gonna change the variable using the green plus again to be price paid for a cow. I'm just gonna get it placed approximately in a usable place. Uh, price paid for okay. Okay. Price paid okay. So now, what I can do, I've got everything set to make all of my player pages, but I'm going to use a template to kind of help the job along. So the things that I can put in a template are the things that are going to be exactly the same, literally exactly the same for each of the players. So that is the dashboard button. Press and hold the shift key the I'm ready button, keep holding the shift key, the price paid for a cow, keep holding the shift key, the cost of the cow. I've selected those four items. Control X to take them off this page. Templates. Oh, okay, okay. Add a new template. Edit paste or control V. Then I'm gonna make this template use my other template. So I'm going a little fast probably, but this is pretty neat. So what I've got going on here now is I have a template, which is based on a template, which has the price and cost of a cow and the I'm ready to advance and the go back to the dashboard page all on it already. I've now created a template that I can use on the rest of my player pages. So that if I ever decide I want to change the color of this dashboard button, I change it once here. Mm -hmm. I don't change it in the five places we're about to copy and paste it. So now that I've got this template, template two, I'm going to go back to my interface. I'm going to select the former one page. And I'm going to say it uses template two. And now it's back to exactly as we had it laid out. Then I'm going to take and I'm gonna say control A, and that's gonna grab everything on the page that isn't on the template. Control C, go to the farmer two page, control V. Go to the farmer three page, control V. 
Then I'm gonna go back to the Farmer 2 page, open the panel, go to the template, and say use template number two. And now we're getting a lot closer to having three player pages. So I'm gonna go to the Farmer 3 page, and again, template two. So now the only thing I have to do is uh, clear out all of the data that each one of the players shouldn't be seeing. So if you remember what I was saying at the beginning of this lesson, multiplayer games are not necessarily about what's going on in the model, but the interactions that are going on between the players, and the interactions that are going on between the players are caused by gaps in information between the players. So it's not an interesting game when you show everybody everything, unless it's purely collaborative, but even then it's not all that interesting. The interesting comes from hiding information from certain players and making sure that other players know it. So the players have to talk to each other to actually figure it all out. So let's go ahead now and let's start deleting information off of each one of the farmer's pages. So let's go to farmer one. And I'm gonna delete cumulative profit two and cumulative profit three right off the graph. And I'm gonna delete herd size two and herd size three right off the graph. I've already set up two order and two slaughter as player one. Player one is done. Player two, first thing I need to do is change two order from player number one to player number two. To slaughter, same deal, player number two. Now the decisions are the same. That was the mistake that I made, which is why Nato was able to see my decisions on her page. I didn't do that. Now because this is player number two, I'm gonna delete herd one and herd three. By default, architect varies the line styles and it uses dashes and dots and things like that. You can change that as a software default or even as a model default. I'm just gonna change it straight up here and into each individual graph to solid. And I'm gonna know that I did this right because when I'm done with this page, the two outputs are gonna be red. So I'm gonna delete converter one, I mean cumulative profit one, cumulative profit three, and make this solid. Player two is done. Player three, cows ordered, we need a number three here. We need a number three here. Delete herd one, herd two, instead of dotted, solid. Delete cumulative profit one, delete cumulative profit two, solid. And we've got a game. Yes? With these dials, um, the reset after setting didn't get copied when I copied them across pages, is it normal? Uh, no. But so, not incredibly surprising. So that, so Interesting. That part, on the second and third pages, it didn't say every time unit. It just said never. Okay, that's odd. For me, it did work, but that doesn't necessarily this is the mean. Page. Can you show me page two or three? I'm not sure if it's still there. Oh, you're right. Haha. <laughs> yes, so. Mm -hmm. Bug for me to fix. So we need to make all, make sure that all of our knobs say every DT or every time unit. It's all the same. Mm. And so now we've got uh, a little multiplayer game set up. The difference between what we just built here, and I'm trying to leave it so that we have 10 minutes for questions, and I think I'm going to be successful, is that um, in the game that we were playing, we had that waiting page that said, oh, we're waiting for the other players to submit decisions. Here, I don't have that. But it's easy enough to create that, but I'm not gonna get it in 10 minutes and have 10 minutes of questions. Yeah. So let's go ahead and let's publish this. Ready, set, file publish. And this brings you to the IC Exchange login. I think most of you have accounts. You can publish multiplayer games for free as long as they correspond to some fairly wide set of rules that are listed in the multiplayer options dialogue and you agree to license your content under the Creative Commons. Billy, at this point, could somebody say our model wasn't quite done? Could they open one up that was finished? Yeah, you 
go to the finished just version of this model to publish it? Publish, um, what model, can you say what model? It's, it's in the folder right next to it called finish. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Okay, so I have a lot of models in my list, um, but I'm going to add a new simulation. I'm going to give it a name. This updates the URL. That way I know what my URL is going to look like. I can describe it, which helps raise my sim in the rankings. That way it shows higher in the, in the list. Keywords, these also help your rankings. And the old the green for the Creative Commons. Um, we offer the ability to not do that, um, but that comes with a fee. Don't know what that is, but I think it's something on the order of 50 a sim a month, Sarah? Yes, it's right. Okay. And I'm going to add the simulation, and I'm going to click the almighty upload button. And it's done. Complete. All right. So now we need to go test our little game. So we click the view link, and we're going to copy that URL out of this little browser window, and we're going to close it. I'm going to show you how you can test the multiplayer game all by yourself so that when you're all on your own and you don't have any friends around with you, you can play your multiplayer game all by yourself. All right. So uh, here we go. I'm going to enter in a nickname. In this tab, I'm going to be the letter A, and I'm going to create a new game, and it's going to be A's game. Come here, paste, paste. In this one, I'm going to be B. In this one, I'm going to be C. So uh, now I've got each role in its own tab, and I'm going to join the game. There's one role available. Join the game. All three roles are in. Ready to start. Ready to start. Game starts. I realize what I forgot to do. Can you tell me what I forgot to do? Probably not. Um, so we hit let's play and I'm left with this run button here. I forgot to actually set up the navigation that puts us into um, each one of the player pages. So that's kind of boring. So when I, this is actually a good teaching moment. So what's going to happen when I hit this run button? I'm right now playing as player C. Player C is going to hit an action that says run the model. We're all interacting in the same model. What are our players A and B going to see? Nothing. Nothing. They're going to see the simulation run all the way through the end. This is how you would make it so that one player has the ability to control what the model is doing. You just put a regular single player action in. So when I hit this run button, hopefully the model runs slow enough because I set a delay to make it run slow that we can see that ah, we weren't able to see it. There we go. So I hit the run button on that tab and we saw it running on this tab. We all are living in the same exact simulation world. We're all occupying the same simulation run. So if one player says, God damn it, we're running, it's gonna run. That's why we have these consensus-based actions. So let's go ahead now and actually fix that run button and then be done. Okay, right, I left this button looking like garbage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, uh, I'll, I'll take this let's play button, copy it. I'm gonna take the run button, delete it, paste. And see that's what happens when you click. It didn't paste exactly where it came from. I have the let's play button, and I'm going to change this button to do a couple of different things. 
Okay. Um, so this button, we're going to want it to navigate each user to the appropriate decision dashboard. So we're going to say, you know, um, two decisions. But the list of actions is going to be totally different. So what we're going to do is we're going to add an action. Navigate to page. Armor 1. So if you're saying, well, wait a minute, everybody can press that button. That button shows up for everybody. But we have this thing called an optional conditional, which controls whether or not this action is enabled based on either the state of our model or who we are. So conditionally navigate the page farmer one mm -hmm. only if we're farmer one. This action is only going to be enabled if we're farmer two, and this one's also going to be a navigate to page farmer two. So this way, farmer. So what's going to happen when this button gets pressed by farmer number two? The software is going to go and it's going to look at that action and it's going to say, okay, I want to go to page one, farmer one. But it's going to say, wait a minute, I have to check and see if I'm allowed to do it. It's going to say, well, what role am I? I'm role farmer one, then I can go. But if I'm role farmer two, it's going to say, nope, I'm not farmer one, do the next one. So these actions are executed in order. So obviously we end this with a third conditional, navigate to page. Farmer 3, this action is enabled for Farmer 3, check it off, and republish. Republishing is nice and easy. We don't have to go through adding a sim all over again. You can just hit the green update interface button, and we're done. So, um, Billy, on mine, it doesn't give the Farmer 1, Farmer 2, and Farmer 3 in my optional condition. It gives it to me when I print it at the top. So but there's two boxes. It gives me so there's farmer, two of them. Farmer, farmer. Um, you probably named all your farmers the same thing. So if you go to your multiplayer uh, setup, uh, just click uh, to your interface settings. Just uh, click on okay. shopping. Right. And pick your multiplayer options. The name is farmer. Uh, I put that them, was my mistake. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, well, well, it's but, my but mistake in how I explained one, it. Right. I assumed that it no, knew so that was farmer one. Uh, so the name is okay. that number. I should actually probably just hide this because we're not actually using it yet. Uh, but one day you'll be able to do you know math essentially on that number and say, oh, if it's less than, if the roll is less than three, go here. Otherwise go there, and that way you can make all of the like facilitator-ish roles okay. in a group and differentiate, but okay. that's the future. All right, so now um, I can actually just refresh this, and it might work. Nope, okay. All right, so I, I need to go through this process and create a new game. And now he's on the appropriate page. Ready, ready, ready. The game went forward. So we'll make some ordering decisions, some slaughtering decisions, some ordering decisions. And we can see that we're all playing together in the same simulation world. So that's a building a multiplayer game from scratch in Learning at eight, eight minutes. <laughs> All righty. Um, questions till I guess I don't know if you have a plane till tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm, we can go other places if you have that many questions. I'm actually pretty hard to decide. Um, yeah, so uh, anything uh, people are curious about? Things people want to see or know how to do or? You mentioned stories that you would come to them, but can you say anything about these and how they interact with these interfaces? Yeah, in fact, let me give a demonstration of that. That's a good point. Stories is like the thing that sets us apart. It's pretty embarrassing that we didn't actually do it in a workshop. Um, now we're going to go to the computer that I'm comfortable with. Nothing is on my screen. So, an example of a story is feeling. Stories allow us to progressively reveal model structure in order to yield insight into model behavior. So here's an example of a story that explains to us what happens in the carrying capacity model. Okay, so this model starts out with just a single stock of population, and it's flat. And then we add a flow, and we can see that that makes the stock grow linearly because it's just a constant. And so what the software is doing for you here automatically is it's cutting all these feedback loops and it's just running a tiny part of the model to generate this behavior. So it takes care of all of this behavior for you. It's actually doing the partial simulation for you. And we hit next, and now you can see that we get exponential growth when we have this structure. Next, the exponential growth changed a little bit because X took away some of the power of the reinforcing feedback loop. Next, and it turns into S-shaped growth. So we can tell the story of how our model is put together by progressively revealing the feedback structures in our model and measuring the impact on behavior. And the way that we make that is by going through and adding a story. And uh, on the story, we choose what structure we want to show. So first I want to show population. I add a page to my story. I want to show births, and I want to add a page to my story, and then I show deaths. Wow, great. And I can progressively reveal structure in my model. What else can you add to those pages? Anything you want. Anything you want. If they're just like regular interface pages, you can have them use templates, so you can put videos that show up on all pages. Can you find pages of the story that the student has always? Um, yeah, you do that by making two different stories. So one story would be for role A, one story would be for role B. Okay. Sorry, I might have missed something. Has the user interacted with that in the input control? Yes. So the mod, you can actually run the model when it's being partially simulated. I'm going to change parameters, right? And it yes. simulates what you can see. So as you reveal structure, each time you simulate, you get more and more rich behavior. Uh, so every time you hit add page, yeah. it puts up a dialogue showing you whatever model content could be visible, and I just click on it and click uh, any connectors I also want to be visible. So let's, let's say you've created one of these stories and it's published. Can you, can you embed that within another website? Yeah, so all of the content that you publish to the internet can be embedded anywhere else with the use of what's called an iframe. Um, and that's documented in the documentation. Thank you. So to share this with your Yeah, I mean, it's, you could go, uh, I mean, this story I haven't published. Actually, I have published this story. So there's a link for it uh, on the IC Exchange. You can actually search for Carry Capacity Learning Lab. because This was uh, the workshop I did last year. Um, and it should show up, and you should be able to use it. Um, any model that you build an architect, any interface you build an architect, Literally what you see is what you get. Everything that's on the desktop, with the exception of literally two button actions that say desktop only next to them in big bold letters, um, work on the internet. Um, everything is built around being published. In fact, when you look at Architect and you're dragging stuff around on a canvas, that's actually Google Chrome. 
everything's a web browser. That means it runs everywhere. It runs on your iPad, it runs on your phone, it runs on a tablet, it runs on a, you know, we could build a song. But. Um, when you check off that box I showed you in the beginning that says Zoom content to fit. Um, it's not responsive in the way that it will automatically relay out your content because um, our layout system is based on arbitrary coordinates. Uh, aspect ratios. Now, now, so it sounds like you're going down this route where I said, you know how there's the and 99.9999999% percent of people will just check that. You might find yourself in the .01 if you're willing to put in that level of effort. So some of those other options in there let you set up a resizing system based on anchors. So you can anchor objects to corners or sides of the page. Um, and it automatically tries to figure out how to get your content to fit um, when aspect ratios change. Um, but it's not great at like going from portrait to landscape on a mobile device. It's better for you know, somebody's got a wide screen versus a four third screen. It can kind of figure out how you wanted your content to fit. Uh, but it's a pretty complex process, and frankly, I really believe that 99.99999% want to just zoom. Yeah. Oh, if you're a developer, then the whole world is open to you. Um, so because all of this is built on top of Google Chrome, we're actually writing HTML and CSS and JavaScript as you're clicking these buttons, um, and we hide that from all of us who aren't software engineers. Um, but uh, we do make that stuff available. So we actually auto-generate our code into templates. Um, and I don't know, there's a support fee which allows you to have access to that third-party developer API where we expose the full extent of our simulation engine and you can actually interact with it in JavaScript. You can use um, you know, HTML to add custom widgets to the page. And I'll show you a quick example. So I show this emergency room case um, all the time. You see, you know, with the people blinking. Uh, but I actually made an example of that uh, that actually used custom code. Things you can't do in the software without being an engineer. Um, yeah, so let me real quickly. So the whole premise behind Architect um, was. Um, you could drag and drop together content, um, and you can do it without knowing how to write software. But the second you reach the bounds of the tool, because there are bounds to the tool, we're not, can't do everything, um, you could turn that over to a software engineer who could create things and add things to it, but that wouldn't get in the way of you continuing to edit your interface inside of Architect. So what we're actually looking at right now is an animation that uh, I custom coded that is also on a page with widgets that I drag and drop. Um, that way, um, you can outsource the development of any. Oh, okay, you can insource the development of any um, widgets you want, and um, you can still let all of your not coders work on it. So this page um, has you know knobs, but like this whole animation here is an SVG animation built with Snap SVG. Um, directly in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And let's see here. Yeah, so I actually have the ability to show you the custom code template, including uh, the full Chrome debugger that you can use to go through and test um, and work on all of your code directly within Architect. It is a full IDP in that sense. So I'll go deeper on that with you offline. Let's share information. What do you think must be open published in the so the default way to publish is to the exchange, um, and that is uh, the free route. We do offer paid options, which involve publishing to the exchange to get past you know, the Creative Commons license, or um, if you want to remove you know, our branding, or I don't remember all the ways, or if you want a special simulation engine or things like that. We do offer options uh, that allow you to publish um, sensitive information um, on your own servers, but that's a pretty involved, pretty in-depth um, process. If that's a thing you're interested in, um, it's a fairly significant yearly licensing fee where we work with you um, to install all of our software on your servers, um, and that's a high-touch, longer you know, enterprise sales process. So if that's a thing um, that you want to know more about, 
share cards with Bob or myself and we can begin that process with you. Yes. Um, the when question is always an interesting question. Um, so the way that our multiplayer games obviously get put together is ad hoc. Um, so you, I mean, you're coming from the Forio uh, mindset, um, where you would set up ahead of time, these are my students, I put them into teams, I assign them roles as a professor, uh, and then they go ahead and do it, um, as opposed to our kind of like self-organizing method. Um, that is something I do want to support. Uh, I think it's got a lot of value, um, but we thought that this worked in a wider use case, because at the end of the day, you can, with pencil and paper, tell Jim, John, and Jane, you're working together, and this is what you do, rather than enforcing that from on high. Um, built into all of this, but not in the same level of depth or detail as the Forio systems, is the ability to collect data out of it. Um, so you can look at and see all the decisions that were made by all of the users. Um, you can look at and see, and this is where I think we go beyond what the Forio platform offers, but it's been six years, so I don't really know anymore. Um, but you can see exactly what page every player looked at, how long they spent looking at that page, what page they went to after looking at that page. So if you saw the talk by Aquilu Tadasi, uh, where he went through and he was mapping, you know, users falling, that's the kind of information you can get out of our system. Um, and it's provided all in clean CSV files that you can analyze in whatever tool you want, because we, are not so many to develop all the analysis tools as well.